can ask you if you have any questions about um, the concept of the transitional object, which I uh, brought up last week, um, which is a psychoanalytic concept. Um, I'm wondering if it's clear uh, the way that um, a transitional object works and, and the way that the, um, I'm arguing that the um, Mrs. Ramsey's shawl, um, which sometimes in the text is called a shawl, sometimes it's called a cloak, um, functions as a transitional object for the characters in the novel. So they're not even aware. It's not an actual object. Obviously, it's a little different. It's in a fiction, but they're, they begin to see green swirls and green cloaks and um, uh, everywhere. And um, it becomes part of their internal dialogue. And it's a sort of trace of Mrs. Ramsey that continues on, right? So the absence of Mrs. Ramsey and what does it all mean? And how do we survive without Mrs. Ramsey is sort of like a question for, uh, I think for modernity, how do we um, survive without the Victorian values and the kind of, um, the kind of care and family um, closeness and the kind of uh, mm, almost romantic values that, and by romantic, I mean like the romantic poets that she embodies. Um, a kind of interconnectedness and a kind of um, ethics of living, like living in a way for the kids, for um, helping underdogs, helping, uh, you know, people that are on the margins. That's what Mrs. Ramsey sort of does naturally. How do we survive without that? How do we continue on without that? And I think that is part of the question the novel asks us. All right, so any, qu any questions about the transitional object or how I'm sort of arguing that it continues on? All right. I might make a slight nod to it, but we're gonna be talking about other things today, all right? So I'll share my screen and um, we'll get going. Um, so I've got here, a few passages uh, from the book, which we will definitely look at. But I sort of want to um, talk about um, a couple basic ideas. So the, the, the final section of the novel um, begins with uh, a qu question, the final section being called The Lighthouse. It says, what does it what does it mean then? What can it all mean, right? And I've just sort of spoken to what the it is, like what is the it, you know, what, um, and in a certain sense for Lily Briscoe at this moment, I don't think she can answer that question. Um, so it begins with a question and ends with a statement. She famously says, I have had my vision. Um, so, um, you know, it was done, it was finished. Yes, she thought, laying down her brush in extreme fatigue, I've had my vision. So, so this, this whole final section, which is about 10 years later in the story, is about, um, in a certain sense, um, answering that question of what can it all mean? Um, and uh, each of the characters has to find that question out for themselves. So that's the, that's the, I think that what makes Virginia Woolf, you know, the kind of writer that she is, she doesn't say there's one answer. James has to figure out what it means. Cam has to figure out what it means. Mr. Ramsey has to figure out what it means. And Lily has to figure out what it means. Lily figures out what it means on the basis of negotiating her relationship to art, right? So it seems to us that, it seems to me at least that the, the novel offers us two ways to live. And I think of them as being kind of interconnected. Um, the first is in and through one's art, that's how Lily lives. And in and through our relationships with others, that's how um, Mrs. Ramsey lived and, um, and how, uh, how other people, 
Mrs. Ramsey sort of is the, the ultimate one that lives through in and through her relationships with others. Um, this, this, this Mr. C is Mr. Carmichael, of course, right, the poet. So he belongs to the same group who lives in and through his art. And if you noticed and you were paying attention, um, you'll notice that uh, Mr. Uh, uh, Carmichael, Lily refers to him um, as uh, impersonal. She says he is very impersonal. So you can see the trace here of, um, of not, again, not an unfriendly person, but a person who lives through their art the way T.S. Eliot lives through his art. In other words, the whole concept of impersonality, which is so important to modernism that I've already brought up. Okay, so I'm gonna focus, and here again, these are just the same notes I'm giving you again about the transitional object that I gave you last time. So I'm gonna focus on two moments in this final section. Um, I'm gonna focus on a moment with Lily and Mr. Ramsey, and then I'm gonna figure, uh, focus on um, uh, uh, a moment between James and Mr. Ramsey. So in each case, Mr. Ramsey represents authority. So in each case, Mr. Ramsey is sort of the um, tradition, if you want to think of it that way. How do we relate ourselves to the tradition, especially if we need to have our own autonomy or separateness? How do we sort of figure that out? How does that work? So these two moments um, uh, I will cover in a moment. The first is in um, chapter two and the second is in chapter eight. Um, all right, so, um, so those are the two moments that I'm gonna sort of argue, um, wrestle with this question of um, how, to maintain, how, to, how, to be how to have a relationship to authority and to power, but also have your autonomy. And this becomes a, a question um, for each of them. Okay. Um, all right, so let's go ahead. Does anybody have any questions about that before we go ahead and look at this, this section? I wanna look at the way I told you, I promised I would do this. Um, this is not this, you know, I have to go back. I kind of did this backwards. I'm sorry, I did it just before I started. I wanted to make sure that you guys had the text in front of you. Um, I'm starting at the end of the section, right here, the end of the section. Uh, called Time Passes and right before we enter into the window, I mean the lighthouse. So the last time we left it with Lily Briscoe carrying the bags up and then um, there's still a trace of the kind of time passes poetic quality and even in the last chapter, chapter 10 of Time Passes, um, in other words, there's still a sense in which the house or this voice is looking over all the characters and kind of all the world. It's almost like, you know, it's almost like Mrs. This is, this chapter might, be, might be belong to the kind of um, lighthouse, kind of Im, impersonal flow of the lighthouse going around right at night, kind of seeing everything participating in everything before we enter into the human realm of um, Lily and, uh, and Mr. Ramsey and James and Cam and Mr. Carmichael. All right. Then indeed peace had come. Messages of peace breathed from the sea to the shore, never to break its sleep anymore, to lull it rather more deeply to rest. And whether the dreamers dreamt wholly, dreamt wisely, to confirm, what else is it murmuring as Lily Briscoe laid her head on the pillow in the clean room and heard the sea? Through the open window, the voice of, be of the beauty of the world came mur murmuring too softly to hear exactly what it said. But what mattered if the meaning were plain? In treating the sleepers, the house was full again. Mrs. Beckwith was staying there, also Mr. Carmichael. Here, let me give you that page. 
oh, it's 146 in my text. Um, if they would not actually come down to the beach itself, at least to lift the blind and look out. They would see then night flowing down in purple, his head crowned, his scepter jeweled, and how in his eyes a child might look. And if they still faltered, Lily was tired out with traveling and slept almost, almost at once. But Mr. Carmichael read a book by candlelight. Remember, that's the way that this whole section begins. Is That's the first bracket as he puts out, blows out his candle. So it's been relit again. If they still said no, um, if they still said no, that it was vapor, the splendor of his, the, the his here is um, the, uh, um, the night, I'm sorry, um, the night, the splendor of his, and the dew had more power than he, and they preferred sleeping gently then without complaint or argument, the voice would sing its song. Gently the waves would break, Lily heard them in her sleep, tenderly the light fell, it seemed to come through her eyelids, and it all looked, Mr. Carmichael thought, shutting his book, falling asleep, much as it used to look. Indeed, the voice might resume as the curtains of dark wrapped themselves over the house, over Mrs. Beckwith, Mr. Carmichael, and Lily Briscoe, so that they lay with several folds of blackness. You should catch all the folds, I think, are connected to the, to the uh, shawl. Um, several folds of blackness on their eyes. Why not accept this, be content with this, acquiesce and resign? The sigh of all the seas breaking in measure round the isles soothed them. The night wrapped them, again, like the shawl. Nothing broke their sleep until the birds beginning and the dawn weaving their thin voices into its whiteness, a cart grinding, a dog somewhere barking. The sun lifted its curtains, broke the veil on their eyes, and Lily Briscoe stirring in her sleep. She clutched at the blankets as if, as a faller clutches at the turf on the edge of a cliff, her eyes opened wide. Here she was again, she thought, sitting bolt right upright in bed, awake. So 10 years and one night, right? That's the, the kind of conceit of this section. <clears throat> She goes to sleep, she wakes up in the same house, only everything has changed. The world has changed, right? All right, so let's take a look at this first section of the lighthouse and then we'll go to the negotiation that I talked to you about before. Oops, I have to figure out how I did this. I guess they went, in reverse. Yes, they went in reverse. Here it is. What does it mean then? What can it all mean? Lily Briscoe asks. So <clears throat> uh, well, let me read a little bit further. Let me read this whole section and then we'll, we'll I'll sort of talk about um, how I see how I see Lily Lily's problem being one of negotiating this distance we talked about before um, the the sort of proper relationship to other people and the proper relationship relations to her art right how to live through one's art and how to live through our relationships with others and how they might actually be mirror images of one another what does it mean what can it all mean Lily Briscoe asked herself, wondering whether, since she had been left alone, it behooved her to go to the kitchen to fetch another cup of coffee or wait here. What does it mean? A catchword that was, caught from some book, fitting her thought loosely, for she could not this first morning with the Ramses contract her feelings, could only make a phrase go uh, resound to cover the blankness of her mind until these vapors had shrunk. For really, what did she feel? come back after all these years and Mrs. Ramsey dead. Nothing, nothing, nothing that she could express at all, all right? So what I want to get at here is I want you to catch an echo. Does anybody catch an echo here between something that Mrs. Ramsey says in the first section?
basically, I think it's um, in chapter, uh, hold on, I think it's chapter 11. Um, yeah, uh, hold on, I'm sorry. Yes, it's in chapter 11. Mrs. Ramsey uh, is thinking um, deeply um, and kind of openly and without any defenses, the same way that Lily is sort of thinking deeply um, without any defenses, kind of open to this nothingness, right? The nothingness that um, for Mrs. Ramsey is the um, core, uh, uh, the core wedge of darkness. And for Lily, this um, nothingness is life without Mrs. Ramsey. And they each say something, a thought slips into their head, which they say, which they're not sure if they mean. Like Lily here says, why, you know, what does it mean? A catchword that was caught from some book. And Mrs. Ramsey says, um, uh, we are in the hands of Lord, of the Lord. And she says, why did I say that? It just slipped into my head, right? So they're in this open space and thoughts sort of slip into their head. And that is part of the, the whole issue, right? Of being in relationship, um, being in a, in, a, in a world, right? Is that, that without you knowing it, thoughts slip into your head. Um, so you might grow up in a home where people say, well, um, I don't know, like maybe, I don't know what, like my mother would say things like, uh, um, I don't know, she would say, oh, California was better before all those people arrived, right? I grew up in California. And so, you know, I, I don't mean to say mean things about my mom, but she's kind of a low key racist, right? I mean, like she's talking about immigrants and I'm thinking, you know, and I just took that in. I just took it in. I just, as a little boy, I just thought, oh, well, um, that is the way that the world is, you know? Like, so like, I think, you know, and then I realized later, I was like, no, that's not the problem with California. The problem with, Cal you know, if there is a problem with California, I don't know that there is, but there, well, I kind of do know there is, but, but um, if there is, it's certainly not that, that immigrants are here, right? They're contributing the economy all, you know, I read the papers just like everybody else. I know that they actually um, bring way more money into the economy than they leach out, you know? Um, and uh, whatever it is, you know, those kinds of things, you know, but I heard the idea, the thought, and it slipped into my head. That's all my point was, simply the same way that the, the, these ideas. So I think this is really brilliant on uh, Virginia Woolf's um, uh, part to show how certain ideas slip into our heads and we can question them, right? Because the real question isn't what does it mean That question um, gets, gets um, sort of displaced for Mrs. Ramsey. The question isn't what does it mean? I mean, for Lily, the question becomes, what can I do? What should I do? You see what a, what a better question in a way it is than what can it mean? What should I do, all right? Are there any questions about that before? I, I, I'm just trying to set up um, chapter two get the picture that here's Lily waking up. Um, she comes down to breakfast, she served coffee and probably some uh, biscuits or whatever else. And, um, and, then, and then she's left alone in the, in the kitchen. It, we find out later that, that um, Mr. Ramsey was kind of pitching a little fit and, um, uh, people ran off to take care of him because he was pitching a little fit and um, she's left alone and she's thinking, what can it all mean? What she's going to find out in her relationship with Mr. Ramsey, trying to understand what, how she's supposed to react, she's going to figure out that the question isn't what does it mean, but what can I do? Okay, so let's go ahead and look at... Um, I'm going to cut through this. Um,
Okay. So I'm going to look at um, the um, chapter two. Right before chapter two of the lighthouse, um, there's this, she's worried about Mr. Ramsey coming close to her. Um, uh, and she says about him, uh, let him be 50 feet away. Let him not, and I'm on my page 153. This is in chapter one. Um, let him not even see you. Let him not, let him not even speak to you. Let him not even see you. He permeated, he prevailed, he imposed himself. He changed everything. Um, so there is a relationship here also between um, when she says, um, in uh, a famous uh, work of um, Virginia Woolf's called A Room of One's Own, in which she's talking about women and uh, their creative power and why they've been they haven't been able to be more successful as writers and painters and so forth. Um, and she says that ultimately the, the argument of the book is that if a, if a woman had a certain amount of money and a room of, of one's own to study and didn't have to take care of kids and didn't have to do this and this and this, they would become great writers and great painters and would have just as many, right? But she, she's talking about the way that typically, um, typically writers, Right, male writers, right, and they and they says the I, right, like I did this, I did that, like that that voice, that big um, pronoun I, um, it obscures everything. Right, so that's a kind of male signifier. It's in a, sig uh, a signifier of the male authorial voice, which obscures everything. So, so writing itself is, is, um, not, is not impersonal enough. It's too filled up with the same thing. And it's the same problem that Mr. Ramsey fills everything up with his needs, his desires, right? So you should be getting, I, what I'm basically trying to say is that you can connect this to a sort of feminist reading of the novel um, that she says this, okay. Um, she could not see the color. She could not, she's looking at her paintings and she's, look, she's back to trying to, she had had that painting set aside and was trying to finish it now, even though Mrs. Ramsey wasn't there, which is very hard to do because I guess she's already sketched in the figure of Mrs. Ramsey. She's trying to get everything else right, like the light. Um, she could not see the color. She could not see the lines. Even with his back turned to her, she could only think. But he'll be down on me in one moment, demanding something she felt she could not give him. All right, so here's the problem of negotiating the distance between her and Mrs. Ramsey. And she feels, I mean, Mr. Ramsey. Um, and here she, she sort of incorporates that ideological voice that says that women can't paint. So later on in that same paragraph, she says, here she is at 44, wasting her time, unable to do a thing, standing there, playing at painting, playing at one thing one did not play at, right? And it was Mrs. Ramsey's fault, she was dead. So, so it's just not only like caught up in this ideological voice, she's kind of regressed to being an infant and being angry at Mrs. Ramsey for leaving. Okay. So here I want to show you another uh, place where I think that I'm looking at the, this, this break here between Chapter one and chapter two of the lighthouse. Um, she's thinking all this, but suddenly he does start coming towards her. It's the first morning. He's going to talk with her. She's terrified. Um, but she says, she says, or, or she thinks, remember, this is free and direct discourse. Um, she would give him what she could. Suddenly we switch points of view. And we're in indirect voice, we're suddenly uh, 
not free and direct, but indirect voice, where suddenly in the, in the point of view of Mr. Ramsey, you see how it switches between the chapters. Um, she seemed to have shriveled slightly, he thought. She looked a little skimpy, wispy, but not unattractive. He liked her. There'd been some talk of her wearing, marrying William Banks once, but nothing had come of it. Her wife had been fond of her. Um, he had been a little out of temper too at breakfast. And then, and then this was one of those moments when an enormous need urged him without being conscious what it uh, was to approach any woman to force them. He did not care how. His need was so great to give him what he wanted, sympathy, right? This is just so intense, right? You know, then it cuts here to, um, what was anybody look, was anybody look, was anybody looking after her? He said, had she everything she wanted? Had she everything she wanted? Now, now, my point, what I think is really interesting here is here he wants sympathy, but rather than ask for sympathy, he asks her if she's okay. But it's clear by the way he asks her that he wants her sympathy. Oh, thanks, everything, said Lily Briscoe nervously. No, she could not do it. She ought to have floated off instantly upon some wave of sympathetic, sympathetic expansion. The pressure on her was tremendous, but she remained stuck. This business of being stuck is here. It's also, it's mentioned several times. It's also what happens to um, Andrew. Um, no, I'm sorry. Uh, happens to James later on the boat. He is also stuck. Okay. Um, uh, all right. Um, all right. She remains stuck. There was an awful pause. This opening, this like things coming too close. He's too close to her. Everything's too close. There was this uh, pause. They both looked at the sea. Why well, I thought Mr. Ramsey said she look at the sea when I am here. They're jumping back and forth between points of view so quickly. It's like they're like their little thought bubbles are getting mixed up, right? Um, uh, she hoped it would be calm enough for them to land at the lighthouse, she said. The lighthouse, the lighthouse, what's that got to do with it? He thought impatiently, instantly with the force of some primeval gust, for really he could not restrain himself any longer. There issued for, from him such a groan that any other woman in the whole world would have done something, said something, all except myself, thought Lily, um, uh, girding herself bitterly, um, who am not a woman, but a peevish, ill-tempered, dried up old maid presumably. I mean, I love this writing. It's amazing how quickly it shifts points of view. So my, my thinking here is that what happens in this novel is that, um, where did I do it? I saw I made a little diagram before. Here it is. Um, there's this little bit of um, two people, like a subject and a subject. And the idea is that if they are friends or in some kind of okay relationship, they cross over a little bit and there's a little bit of this area here that's, that's connected. And that's a kind of nice model of friendship and love. But what can happen if they, if they kind of overlap too much is you get this large area of enmeshment and they can't pull apart, they can't think. And that's what seems to happen here is that Mr. Ramsey's need and her fear are so great because I feel like most of us could handle Mr. Ramsey in this moment. Like he'd come up and you'd say, gosh, I'm so sorry, Mr. R. I'm so sorry, I'm, you must miss her terribly. It must be awfully hard for you. Also to raise the kids, that must be really hard. How are you getting by? I'm so sorry. Is there anything I can do? You shouldn't be asking me what I can do, what you can do for me. I should be saying what I should do for you, but she can't do it, right? And she feels so angry at herself because she can't do it. It's not in her nature to be this kind of, you know, making men feel more comfortable about themselves. But most of us know that the protocol is you do this for anyone who's lost anything. But Mr. Ramsey was already like this. We saw it in the first chapter. He wanted his wife to say she loved him. She, he needed to be right in every argument. Have you ever heard that statement? Like, um, would you rather be right or happy? I remember the first time I heard it, I was like, I don't understand the question. Of course, I want to be right. But then I, after I've gotten older, I'm like, yeah, yeah, I guess I want to be happy more than I need to be right in every situation. But Mr. Ramsey needs to be right 
and you need to make him happy about it. You see what I'm saying? It's not enough. You can't even disagree. It's not even enough. So this kind of enmeshment happens between them. So again, returning to my, base, my basic um, thesis here, that, that the novel offers us two ways of um, dealing with this. You know, it shows us um, how we can live through our art or how we can live through our relationship to one another. And then it sort of shows us that that's almost a false choice, that you kind of need to do, be able to do kind of both. You need to be able to live creatively. In order to live creatively, you need to be able to negotiate your relationships with other people. Um, one can be a monk, I suppose, and live off in a cave somewhere, but even then you're gonna come in contact with someone and you're going to have to negotiate that relationship with someone, even if it's an internalized someone. Because what we find out in this, there's a whole, I don't have time to focus on it. There's two beautiful chapters filled with Lily's dealing with her internal feelings for Mrs. Ramsey, right? Which are probably displaced feelings for her own mother who maybe she lost early or something, I don't know. But in any case, it's very, very beautiful, but we don't have time to, 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 to fixate on it but, or to focus on it. But my point is simply that even if you don't have another person around you, you've internalized certain relationships and you need to kind of negotiate them. And so we get this phrase that comes out a bit later, so much depends upon distance. This is when she's trying to figure out her painting, but she's also looking at the fact that now that Mr. Ramsey's far away from her, she feels relaxed, she can feel pity for him, all of this. So it's a kind of physical distance, but it's also a sort of abstract distance that you would, that you would try to negotiate as a painter or a novelist or something like that. All right, then Mr. Ramsey sighs. He says a bunch of things. Um, and basically they're both in, they both begin to hate one another, like, and themselves sort of. He like wants her to say something and be nice to her. She won't. He just, get, and finally it's like an impasse. And she looks down um, and says, where is it? Oh, it's not here. Hold on, I'll show you. Here it is. She looks down and says, what beautiful boots, she exclaimed. She was ashamed of herself to praise his boots when he had asked her to solace his soul, when he had shown her his bleeding hands, right? His, this is sort of like he's crucified. He's like um, martyred and he's showing her his stigmata. Um, his bleeding hands, his lacerated heart, and asked her to pity them, then to say cheerfully, ah, but what beautiful boots you wear, deserved she knew, and, and looked up expecting to get it in one of his sudden roars of ill temper, complete annihilation. Instead, Mr. Ramsey smiled. His pall, his draperies, his infirmities fell from him. Ah, yes, he said, holding up his foot for her to look at. They were first-rate boots. There was only one made in, man in England who could make boots like the, that. Boots are among the chief curses of mankind, he says. Bootmakers make it their business to cripple and torture the human foot. And then he goes on in this long talk about boots, and he's so happy because she praised his boots, right? He even says... You, most people don't know how to tie their boots properly. Let me show you. And he gets down on his knees and ties her boots. He reverses it. Like she's supposed to get down and wash his feet because he's the lacerated heart of Jesus and all that, but it gets reversed and it's, it's great. And so what I'm sort of suggesting here is uh, as I write here, um, the boots are the metonym for the man. I don't know if you remember this, but a metonym is a part for the whole, like, may I have your hand in marriage? 
you don't really want the hand of the woman, you want the whole woman. It's another figure, it's a kind of figure like a metaphor, but it, felt it functions differently. A metaphor stands for something else, and a metonym is a little part of something else, which stands for that whole something else that there's already a part of, right? So a metaphor, you might say something like, um, uh, I, I, you know, the, her, the, the flower of her face bloomed or her face bloomed, right? That's a, a flower as, as, as a metaphor for a face. A metonym would have to be something like where um, he noticed, he noticed the smallest, you know, corner of her mouth lift. And that becomes a metonym for her happiness, all of her happiness, right? It, that little part stands for the whole, whatever, um, her whole mood or something like that. The boot becomes a metonym for the man and she succeeds and he's happy and he likes her again. And he's, he's happy because she praises him, you know, she, she praises him in a way that was important. So why boots? I don't know, maybe boots stand for masculinity in a way. Um, they stand for something he thinks about about himself. Um, they become a metonym, right? For some of my friends, um, I wear lots of hats. So for some of my friends, a hat is a metonym for David. Like, oh, David must be here. There's his hat, you know. Um, uh, you know, of course, I'm bald and I can't go outside without getting skin cancer. But like, um, the, the hat becomes a metonym for me. The boots become a metonym for Mr. Ramsey. And through that, they work through something, through all that discomfort. They almost had to go through it all before the opening was there and they found their proper distance, right? So my argument would be something like they go from, uh, they go from being in this kind of enmeshed space, right? Where they're, they kind of overlap one another to being able to, oops, to being able to, oh, stop this. To being able to be separate, I can't do it right now, but you know what I'm trying to do. I'm trying to move this one circle away from the other circle, but it's not where, okay. Uh, we're able to be separate. Come on, David, let's do it. Oh, it's not working. There we go, separate. <laughs> so they're together and then they're separate. They really get that space and the boots and then he can bend down and tie her shoes. There's nothing, it's a little awkward for her, but there's nothing weird about it. There's nothing like uh, um, creepy, you know? He's showing her how to tie his boots, though so nobody knows how to do it possibly, right? Properly, excuse me. And um, the only other point I wanna point out to you in this chapter is like, it returns to her um, point of view and, um, and she says, there's no helping Mr. Ramsey on the journal, journey he's going on. Meaning the journey to the lighthouse becomes again, a metonym for another journey, which is the journey of life without Mr. Ramsey. So, so that's all I wanted to say about that um, chapter and about that interaction. But do you, do you see how it, it, it requires this, you know, everything depends, depends upon distance. It requires the proper distance and the, the shoes provide for that, that um, distance. And then she's able to maintain her relationship to Mr. Ramsey. She's able to be a little like Mr. Mrs. Ramsey. This should remind you of the end of the window when she, he wants her to say, I love you, but she won't say it but she is able to show him that she loves him. And somehow through complimenting his boots, Lily is able to give him the attention he needs and he's able to feel better about things and he's able to move on. Okay, are there any questions about, about what I'm sort of saying here?
Okay. Let's look at James then. We're going to look at chapter eight. This is not the first um, moment when they are um, this is not the first moment when they're on the boat, but it's the first um, moment when this uh, thing happens and uh, and it begins it begins in cam's point of view so let's go ahead and um, um, read from it. I have a little bit of it here. Yes. They don't feel a thing there, Cam thought, looking at the shore, right? So it's um it's two two points of view on the same distance. Lily is looking for the boat and Cam is looking back at the shore. They don't feel a thing there, Cam thought, looking at the shore, which rising and falling became steadily more distant and more peaceful, right? The farther you are, the more peace you have, right? The hand cut a trail in the sea as her mind made green swirls and streaks in patterns and numbed and shrouded, wandered in imagination in that underworld of waters where pearls stuck in clusters to white sprays, where the green light, uh, where in the green light a change came over one's entire mind and one's body shown half transparent enveloped in a green cloak. So you should again, imagine the green shawl, Mrs. Ramsey's green shawl, right? Then the eddy slacked around her hand. The rush of water ceased. The world became full of little creaking, squeaking sounds. One heard the waves breaking and flapping against the side of the boat as if they were anchored in a harbor. Everything became very close to one. For the sail upon which James had his eyes fixed until it had become to him like a person whom he knew sagged entirely. There, there they came to a stop, flapping about, waiting for a breeze in the hot sun, miles from shore, miles from the lighthouse. Everything in the whole world seemed to stand still. The lighthouse became immovable and the line of the distant shore became fixed. The sun grew hotter and everybody seemed to come very close together and to feel each other's presence, which they had almost forgotten. McAllister's fishing line went plumb down in the sea. But Mr. Ramsey went on reading with his legs curled under him. <clears throat> All right, so I just wanna stop for a second and I wanna focus on this line here. Everything became very close to one. So I think what this, what this, what this means here is very, very uh, complicated or what it, what, it, what it sort of says to us. It means that in that moment when the wind stops and their journey stops and they're stuck on this small boat together, that the distance, the proximity to them is too close, right? So everything, you know, let's see, let's count how many people are in the, in the, in the boat. There's um, uh, the fishermen, uh, the fisherman's boy, um, James, Cam, and Mr. Ramsey. There's five of them, right? So there's five in the boat. And when everything stops, there's one in the boat. You see, five turns into one. And, it, and everybody, it's too close for comfort. It's uncomfortable. It's hot, right? It's just like... <sighs> everything becomes very close to one. But it also means when you're in a situation like that, things become too close to you. That's what the one means there, like you. Everything became uh, very close to one, right? Um, but I, you see how she uses that impersonal uh, pronoun there in order to get at the kind of problem of losing one's autonomy, of becoming enmeshed, with, with, with everything else. James already has this problem. He sees himself as too like his father as we're about to discover, right? So, all right. So here we go on with the description of Mr. Ramsey. 
He was reading a little shiny book with covers modeled with covers modeled like a plover's egg. In order to explain this to you, you have to understand that back in the 19th century, if I had a book like this, I would take it to a book uh, binder and he would put a beautiful cover around it so that I could keep it forever and it wouldn't get damaged. That's what they did. So he has this beautiful little book of, I think it's poetry. Um, he keeps reciting um, William Cooper's poem, The Castaway. Um, which is an interesting poem because it's about somebody who had been had fallen off the a boat into the sea and his and the boat just leaves him and it's about him treading water in the sea until he dies so it's a very interesting um interesting poem right for him to be reading um, he was reading a little shiny book uh, with covers modeled like a plover's egg now and again as they hung about in that horrid calm he turned a page and James felt that each page, would, page was turned with a partic particular gesture aimed at him, now assertively, um, now commandingly, now with the intention of making people pity him. And all the time as his father read and turned one after another of those little pages, James kept dreading the moment when he would look up and speak sharply to him about something or other. Why were they hanging about, lagging about here? Um, he would demand, or something quite unreasonable like that. And if he does that, James thought, then I shall take a knife and strike him in the heart. There we are. We're right back to the beginning of the book. James wants to kill his father. And he wants to kill his father because, he, and he has to work through this in this sort of whole sort of psychological, you know, uh, process. He had always kept this old symbol of taking a knife and striking his father to the heart. Only now, as he grew older and sat staring at his father with an impotent rage, it was not him, that old man reading he wanted, whom he wanted to kill, but it was the thing that descended on him without knowing it, perhaps, that fierce, sudden, black-winged harpy, it's a, like a huge bird of prey, um, with its talons and its beak all cold and hard that struck at you and struck at you. He could feel the beak on his bare legs where it had struck when he was a child and then made off. And there he was again, an old man, very sad, reading his book. That he would kill, the harpy, right? He would strike it to the heart. Whatever he did, and he might do anything he felt looking at the lighthouse in the distant shore, whether he was in business, in a bank, a barrister, a man at the head of some enterprise, he would fight. He would track down and stamp out tyranny, despair despotism, he called it, making people do what they do, did not want to do, cutting off their right to speak, right? So again, it's the tyranny, the authority of that closeness, that enmeshment, that ideological constraint that he wants to break free of. He wants to be able to have his autonomy, but he can't have it close to his father. And then he goes on to think about how um, he's like his father, um, how they're like one another, um, uh, how there are only two people uh, in the world that um, are like one another. It's them and him, right? So they go from, I should have written five because I think I forgot the fisherman's boy. Maybe the fisherman's boy isn't here. Maybe it's just the fisherman, right? But I think this boy is here. Um, it's either five or four. So there's um, either five or four of them here. Uh, and you get five or five, four, three, two, one, as it gets slow. And then they're stuck. And these two are stuck together. And he, he displaces his anger at his father onto this image he calls a harpy. The other distance that gets collapsed is the distance between then and now. So James goes into a fantasy where he remembers the stroller, um, and everything that's on um, that's on page one eighty eight. He says, um, "Suppose that that then that as a child sitting helpless in a perambulator or on someone's knee, he had seen a wagon crush ignorantly and innocently someone's foot. Suppose he had seen the foot first in the grass, smooth and whole, and then the wheel, and then the whole foot, purple crushed. But the wheel was innocent. So now, when his father came striding down the passage, knocking them up." early in the morning to go to the lighthouse down, it uh, came over his foot, over Cam's foot, over anyone's foot. One sat and watched it. So all of his memories go back 
to being a child, right? And he remembers him saying it's going to rain and he won't be able to go to the lighthouse. And then he says this really interesting thing. Um, he says, um, um, for nothing was simply one thing. This is on my page 189. Um, what I take this to mean, and he's talking about the lighthouse, right? He's saying, um, uh, no, the other was also a lighthouse. So um, mm, he's sort of imagining that, that nothing is ever one, one thing. And it's this distance he needs to be able to say, I'm not the same as my father, right? I am, dif I am different. Both things can be true. I can be me and I can be like my father and then, I can move on. I've got this distance that I need. Um, finally then, uh, it comes here where it says, there he sat with his hand on the tiller in the sun. This is at the end of chapter nine. Um, no, I'm sorry, the end of chapter eight. There he sat with his hand on the tiller in the sun, staring at the lighthouse, powerless to move, powerless to flick off these grains of misery, which had settled on his mind, one after another. A rope seemed to bind him there and his father had knotted it and he could only escape by taking a knife and plunging it. But at that moment, the sail swung round again, slowly round, filled slowly out. The boat seemed to shake herself and then uh, to move off conscious in her sleep. And then she woke and shot through the waves. The re relief was extraordinary. They all seemed to fall away from each other again and to be at their ease. And the fishing lines slanted taut across the sea of the boat. But his father did not raise himself. He only raised his hand um, mysteriously high in the air and let it fall on his knee again as if he were conducting some secret symphony. <clears throat> then as if to comment on that, we get inside of in a, in a parenthetical paragraph. She has several of these very short paragraphs um, in a parenthetical paragraph, uh, chapter nine, um, we get um, the sea without a strain on it, uh, a stain on it, thought Lily Briscoe, still standing and looking out over the bay. The sea stretched like a silk across the bay. Distance had an extraordinary power. They had been swallowed up with it, she felt. They were gone forever. They had become part of the nature of things. It was so calm, it was quiet. So her distance comments on James's distance, right? And you saw, and the, and, um, the streamer, uh, uh, the smoke hangs in the air and droops like a flag, right? So also the wind is there, they're all connected. They're connected through this distance. <clears throat> Then in, and it, it is the next chapter 11 that begins with so much then depends upon distance. So again, I have this one, which is a figure of speech. It's a number, it's a concept. Um, and then this strange working through that happens for each of the characters, their ability to find a certain amount of distance. So in the end, the end of the, the book, we have Lily at her easel and um, in her painting on the easel, she's able to make one small little mark on the easel, right? With her paintbrush, that one small little mark, you know, that changes everything. With that one small little mark on the easel, she's able then to say, I have had my vision, right? 
and she thinks about James and his father at that point, they've made it to the lighthouse at this point. And what's really interesting about this is this past tense, right? I think it might be called the past perfect tense. I'm not certain. Um, does anybody know pluperfect? I have had my vision. Um, I'm not exactly sure. Um, let me read that little passage. Quickly, as if she were re recalled by something over there, she turned to her canvas. There it was, her picture. Yes, with its greens and blues, its lines running up and across, its attempt at something. It would be hung in the attic, she thought. It would be destroyed. But what does that matter, she asked herself, taking up her brush again. She looked at the steps. They were empty. She looked at her canvas. It was blurred. With a sudden intensity, she saw it clear for a second. She drew a line there in the center. It was done. It was finished. Yes, she thought, laying down her brush in extreme fatigue. I have had my vision. And that's the last line of the novel. So in a weird way, it may be Virginia Woolf speaking, saying, I've had my vision, I've written my book. There it is. I have had it. Um, it's strangely in the past with this, this strange tense. Um, several points in, in this, in this section, um, Lily realizes that she can't be like Mr. Carmichael. She wants to, he's an artist too, so she wants to share with him, but he is so distant and removed. Um, I think he represents kind of um, Victorian art, like Yeats or something like that, where she represents the future, like James Joyce or Samuel Beckett or something, Lily does. Um, and so she, they don't have a language to discuss, but they both stand there looking out. And then she's able to paint in front of him, make that final mark. And uh, the poet and the painter, and there's some reconciliation, there's some resolution at the end of the novel. The, um, the term, uh, that happens here at the end, what does she say? It, it is finished? Yes, it was finished. This was um, supposedly in the book of John uh, in the Bible, in the, in the um, New Testament. Um, and I think John's, it's the, it's the last gospel printed. I don't know if it's, I don't think it was the last written. Um, it says, uh, it was finished or the last words of Christ um, on, on the cross, supposedly in the book of, of John. I think he says it is finished instead of it was finished, but you see the finality we have here, right? I've, it is finished, I've had my vision. The resurrection is possible now, you know. Life can go on after all of this horror. So um, are there any questions about anything in this section or anything I've covered? I've tried to sort of make an argument here that um, Lily takes over as the main character as a kind of way of thinking about modernism taking over from Victorian values and, um, and Lily as a new kind of artist. Um, Any questions from anyone? Let me, um, if we're okay, let me just say a couple words about your text for um, Thursday. Your text for Thursday is on Carmen. Um, it's called Crap's Last Tape. Um, and I'll make sure 
or maybe I'll even send it out an announcement so everybody gets it. It's not a long play, so I'd like you to read it before um, before Thursday. It, I mean, seriously, it's it's only about five or six pages, um, and it's a little bit abstract, so you you have to work on it a little bit. But I also want to give you a heads up. Let me put this in the chat. Um, there is a good version of the of the play. Um, oops, I don't want this one. There is a good version of the uh, of the play that um, you can watch. It takes about an hour to watch on YouTube because there's a lot of silences in it. Um, but it's very very good. Um, starring John, the actor John Hurt. Um, who is an old guy now for me. I remember him uh, from back in the day, but, but um, you might remember him. Those of you who have seen the movie V for Vendetta might remember him as the chancellor or the, I, didn't, I don't remember what, what they called him, the, the person who was like the dictator. Um, I think it was the chancellor in V for Vendetta. Oh, that one is unavailable. Um, let me just type it in here and see if you can find it. If I find it, I'll send a, um, Adam Egoyan is the director. Um, perhaps let's take starring John Hurt. Okay. Um, that's the best I can do for now, but it's a good version. You can read it and still get the whole feeling of it. There might be other versions of them out there. Why I like this version is it's well shot. Adam McGoyan's an interesting director um, and it sticks very close to the, to the play. Okay, so Samuel Beckett, as I'll talk about more on Thursday, continues on the tradition of the sort of Irish outsider artist, right? So we had, um, uh, Oscar Wilde, Yeats. We didn't talk about James Joyce, but he's another. And now we have Samuel Beckett, these kind of um, outsider artists who um, um, they're outsider because for uh, in Britain, uh, I, the Irish were often um, looked down upon and, and uh, treated poorly. And of course, arguably Northern Ireland is still occupied by English forces. So, um, so there's a kind of tension there. And, and um, I don't know how much of that plays itself out. It certainly plays itself out in Joyce. I don't know how much of it plays itself out in Beckett, but Beckett's also an experimental writer and you'll see him taking us into even newer psychoanalytic directions. Um, yes, and I will talk about transitional objects again and I'll probably talk about um, the strange time structure that the, that the that that play gives us and that this novel gives us. So um, one is always negotiating what is absent physically, and one is always ne negotiating what is past. Not only what is present and not only what is happening in the moment, but what is absent and what is past also comes with us. That's the argument about modernity that psychoanalysis gives us and, and many of these texts gives us is that we're sort of stuck carrying around these people with us or these situations and sometimes people. And how do we negotiate that? How do we get free? How do we get autonomy? How do we get to be more fully human without this kind of impact? So, so you see in the beginning of our class, um, The problem of humanism was a problem of, of how to um, how to live in a world where there was no longer the structuring sort of idea of um, religion, right? How to be human without um, without religion, and then you know because religion was couldn't organize societies. It can certainly be part of your life, but you needed a governmental structure. So you needed to have something, um, you needed to have something secular. So you have the secular world and then moving into modernism, the question is with the 
failure of empire, right? Remember that in uh, 1910, roughly, um, Britain controlled um, Britain controlled something like 25 percent of the planet in terms of its in terms of its colonies and its and its uh, population, um, not not geographically, but the the population 25 percent. They will lose all of it within a few years and um, lose it, give it back, do whatever they do. You know, it will no longer be the great empire, um, and. And, um, and so how to live in that world, right? That becomes a question. So any questions and I'll just shut up. <laughs> okay, good. Well, I hope to see you um, maybe at the reading on Thursday. I mean, sorry, tomorrow, Wednesday at 5 p.m. Um, and it shouldn't be a long reading. It should be, the reading itself should be about 45 minutes and then about 45 minutes for questions and answers for these marvelous poets. So um, anyway, have a wonderful couple days. I'll see you for a discussion of Samuel Beckett on Thursday. Bye.